Um, apparently, the mic is not working, so I don't need to emphasize the importance of staying as quiet as possible so everybody is able to hear the Divrei Chochma that we hope to hear today from the panel of illustrious Rabonim sitting on the other side of me. Okay, so I will say that again, a little louder. It's not working. The microphone is not working, so I will talk as clearly and as clearly as possible. Um, and hopefully that maybe in the meantime, um, can you text Tally that the microphone is not working? Thanks. Um, my name is Chaim Fachler, and I have the schus of not only standing here at this first annual expo dedicated to mental health issues here in Yushalayim, Irak, Kodesh, but also the schus of moderating this very, very important panel to discuss some of the many halacha issues that we need to address when it comes to mental health issues. My claim to fame is twofold. My first claim to fame is that I am the younger brother of the late Rabbi Mordechai Fachler, who was a pioneer in halacha and mental health in Johannesburg and later in London. And when he was nifter many years ago, the world lost a pioneer in halacha and mental health. So for me, to be standing here in this expo, where we have probably more than 1,500 people having been today in the Nefesh Benefesh campus just for the issues of mental health, for me is a, a huge schus and very encouraging and enlightening and uplifting. My second claim to fame is that I have the schus for the last 10 years of working at my Yeshua Medical Center with a focus specifically on the mental health center that many of you have heard about during the day and at the booth upstairs. I would like you all please to turn your phones off so that we can hear the speakers as clearly as possible. I will not be introducing each of the panelists. They will do that themselves. But I want to start off immediately to hear Divrei Kedusha and Divrei Chochma from the Rosh Yeshiva Shlita Harav Yitzchok Berkowitz Please pay attention to what he has to say. I'm not sure what you meant by Divrei Kedusha. Dealing with any issue facing the Jewish people is holy. What this session in particular is addressing is the cooperation between mental health professionals and Rabbanim, the need for it. And here I'll say that uh, there's a need for getting people to understand why each of the two was a necessity. And also to inform people that it's already in existence, not enough, not nearly enough, but it's available. So let me just begin. To the Jew, everything is halacha. Halacha, that's the guide to life given us by the Creator. Not only as obligation, but as the guide to the most meaningful and pleasurable life on this earth and of course in the world to come. But you gotta remember, the same creator who created the heavens, created the earth, created the human body and the human psyche. And they've gotta be in sync. He created our neshamas and he created our bodies. 
They've got to be in sync. It couldn't be, it could just could not be that he created us in a way that for your emotional well-being, you've got to do one thing. For your physical well-being, you've got to do something else. And for your olam haba, you've got to do a third thing. It's the same creator. The genius of the creator who created every bit of detail in the human eye and digestion created the complex human psyche, that same one. And he created our neshamas. Our physical and spiritual needs are in sync. They've got to work together. The Kuzari speaks of the Chacham, the wise man, as a Moshel, something of a governor who rules over every aspect of himself. There is no such thing as caring about one part of your existence without the other. It's just not going to function. It's like the governor who decides that all he cares about is that there be gardens all over the place, that you have flowers growing at the intersections. But other than that, let the whole place fall apart. It just won't work. You've got to take care of every one of the needs and everything's got to work together. This is our obligation. Our obligation in being here and the result of it, once again, is the most pleasant lifestyle. Dealing with every aspect of our existence. That is the world of halacha. Halacha is a world of principles being applied to situations the realities of which one must be aware of. You cannot ask a question if you don't know what's going on. You can't get an answer if you don't know what's going on. Part of what's going on is what is available. You see, this is where understanding the reality comes in. And for this, Baruch Hashem, so many secrets of nature have been revealed and secrets of the human personality have also been revealed. Mental health is a science. It's a science, like all science, it's research-based. It's not this theoretical thing. It's based on you know what you do and you know what result you get. You know the different issues and you know how to deal with them. Of course, it's complicated because the human psyche is so complex. A Rav that is making a decision without consulting with a professional does not know what the question is. A professional that is not working in sync with a Rav is not going to deliver what Hashem wants you to do, and whether he thinks so or otherwise, is not going to be able to provide for you the highest quality of life. They've got to go together. There's just one creator, the creator of the physical laws of nature and the creator of the spiritual laws of nature. They've got to work together. There seemed to be this myth that every Talmud Chacham is well-versed in kochas hanefesh and understanding psychology. <coughs> or, I guess, tamidei chacham have ruach hakodesh. Now, the first is every Jew has ruach hakodesh. We daven ruach kodesh al tikach bimenu, paraphrasing the pasuk, uh, bimeni. We all have ruach hakodesh. We all have the ability to intuit things that go past simple logic. but that we can figure out reality without studying it, we're not aware of that. I have yet to hear of people going to their Rav and asking them, you know, I have a plumbing problem. What should I do? I mean, I would hope to send you to a plumber. If you don't study the human psyche and study today, again, it's a science. It's a science. If you don't study it, you don't know it. Sure. A Rav who's well-versed in all the different aspects of halacha, of Torah, should be able to know what is the kosher or non-kosher way of going about things, but only after he understands the reality of it. There's a need for working together. I think today it is understood by the majority of Rabbanim. It has to be understood by the population as well. And you know, there are different, there are so many different cultures within, within orthodoxy. For some cultures, there's the need for breaking the news to them that even though you're going to the Rav, you must consult with a professional. For others, it's that even though you're going to a professional, Rabbanim are not out of it. It's not that Rabbanim are these old fogies living in the dark ages that don't know what's going on. 
They may not know everything. But to be a Rav today, you've got to know a lot of what's going on. And there is a need for their input. All in all, I would hope that the message of this particular session is very clear. And that is that you've got to find a Rav. You've got to find a Rav that you know is going to consult with the right people and will know what to do with the information. Work with both. Work with both. I want to add one more thing, and this is with regard to Rabbanim in general. I'll try. I'll try. There's a limit to how much I can strain my voice. I'll try. I talk all day. It's difficult. <laughs> Maybe I'll be a bit, a, a bit, a bit daring in saying this, but it, it is definitely true. When someone's got a question, so I guess you would want to go ask the greatest Rav you can get to. Right? The greatest. He'll give you the accurate answer. That is not necessarily so. If the greatest understands your question, he will definitely give you the best answer. But the first thing you've got to find is the Rav that will understand the question. And in order to understand the question, especially when you're dealing with mental health, he's got to understand you, your background, your culture. Going to Rabbanim who cannot relate to you is not asking the question. You're getting an answer to some other question, not the one you asked. The question he understood, not the one you presented him with. And you're at fault, because he thinks he understands you. So it's not necessarily the greatest. It's the Rav that you feel can understand where you're coming from, will be able to take so many of the different factors that are part of the question. Your background, your culture. He's got to understand that. I studied in the mirror for many years, Rav Chaim Shmulebed, the Colonel of Racha, once said, I'm wiser than everybody else. All the Rosh Yeshivas, they think they understand Americans. I know I don't. <laughs> so you've got to make sure you ask the right Rav. And I hope that among the different sessions that we've got here, you'll also understand that you have to find the right professional, someone who really is qualified. All right, I don't want to take too much time. We have so much to do here. I probably already did over time. <laughs> Just to remind everybody, the microphone is not working. I apologize for that. Um, and we will try to raise our voices, but it'll help if everybody is as still and as quiet as possible with their smartphones off. Apologies, but that's the situation we have today. Um, the Kloza Mugarov once said that the, the saying in the Gemara, Toiv Shaboroifim Lagehinom, the best of the doctors, their place is, I won't even translate the word Gehinom, is because if they think, if they think, they are the best and they do not consult and do not continue to study and learn, then they are not the people they think they are. I think that if this message that the Rosh Hashiva has given to us is the only message we take out of the expo today, I think Dayenu. But we do have other very prominent and eminent panelists. I would like to call upon our co-sponsor, for this very special expo, Rabbi Dr. Shmuel Harris from Machon Devir to address the crowd here today. Thank you. I'll just start by saying as a correction, I'm not a rabbi. And by way of introduction, being told Tov Shabaroifim Legehi Nom, that I then get called up immediately after, is a little bit concerning, but thank you, Chaim, anyway, for those words. I, I don't want to speak for too long. I want to be mechazek, really, what the Rosh Yeshiva mentioned. It's uh, very much 
a sentiment and a philosophy that is shared on the other side by myself and Dr. Friedman will speak after, maybe Rabbi Dr. Friedman. Um, what, what I would like to say actually is from our perspective, the importance of cultural and I would say halachic sensitivity of mental health clinicians. And I think we're very blessed to be living Baruch Hashem in Eretz Yisrael, in our homeland, and we're working as from mental health clinicians with many other from mental health clinicians and looking after patients and clients who themselves are from and requiring um, clinicians who are sensitive to those needs. It's almost impossible. The, the Rosh Yeshiva was speaking before. Good afternoon. My name's Dr. Shmuel Harris. <laughs> Some people know me as a rabbi occasionally. Um, so the Rosh Hashiva mentioned the importance of Rabbanim understanding the metziyot, the mental health metziyot. Uh, I would add of the importance of mental health clinicians being sensitive to the halachic metziyot and the cultural frames of reference and background of the person who's sitting before them. We speak about in medicine being sensitive to patients, uh, to the clients who are before us and understanding who they are, where they come from. Nowhere else is this more important than in the area of mental health, where the way that a person experiences and deals with their mental health issues is framed by who they are, their background, where they come from, their values, their philosophies, and all of this needs to be taken into account. By way of example, if we think about incorrect diagnosis that can often happen when a clinician is not sensitive to the background, uh, the cultural background of the client who's sitting before them. Uh, a little example uh, and a nuance would be if we think about if I have a yeshiva bocha who's sitting before me uh, and this yeshiva bocha happens to be from a breast lab background and he tells me that several times a week he goes off to do something called his boidodos, he spends hours in a forest talking, talking to himself, talking to the creator, talking to, to try and motivate himself to try and connect, I would say that this is perfectly reasonable and understandable. If I have a Bachar who's come from Brisk, who's telling me that he's doing the same thing every day, this might be a cause for concern, or at least requires further investigation. So the importance of cultural sensitivity, of halakhic sensitivity, is essential. And I think from the flip side of the coin that clinicians need to be working very closely together with Rabbanim, to be in regular contact with them and to be able to collaborate because not only in terms of diagnosis but also in terms of treatment, having the halakhic framework is tremendously empowering and tremendously validating when it's engaged and used appropriately for this person who's sitting before me. And if the clinician is part of that framework where they're walking, working together with a Rav and the Rav is validating and tying in with the work that the clinician is doing, this can only lead to better outcomes. And I've been very zoiche for the past several years working together with <laughs> Rav Yonatan Rosenzweig, Rav Yoni Rosenzweig. Uh, we've been zoiche to put out a safer dealing with mental health and halach, which we hope is uh, one of many in this genre and should encourage many other clinicians and Rabbanim to contribute to this important siach, this important discourse, because ultimately, we're all working on the same team and we all want to see better outcomes for our congregants, for our clients. Um, thank you. My name is Dilchaim Fachler. <laughs> for those who didn't hear earlier. Shkoyach of Shmuel, Shkoyach again to the Rosh Hashiva. Um, one of the examples that Professor Strauss, the head of the psychiatric wing of Maina Yeshua gives, talking about cultural sensitivity, is how many times we wash our hands during the day. Somebody from a Torah background does it far more often than others. And if the clinician gets that wrong and diagnoses the patient as psychotic rather than OCD, you can actually kill the patient. And so it is not just a good idea, it is pikuach nefesh, to understand the cultural background of the patient. So having called my friend Shmuel uh, Rabbi Doctor um, and being told off for that, can I call Rabbi Yoni Rabbi Yona? 
Okay, Rabbi Yoni, to Orson Spike, please, as a follow up to Rav Shmuel, please. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to the Rosh Shiva for coming and for uh, sharing his words, and for my friend, uh, Dr. Harris. Um, I, uh, I was wondering what to say in the few minutes that I have. Um, I think that there are a lot of questions on halacha and mental health, and the fact that there are so many people here um, really shows how important the issue is to uh, so many people. Um, I always say that when I came into this field, about four years ago, four or five years ago, I was getting probably um, in the, my 13, 14 years of Rabbanus, uh, before that moment, uh, I got about as many questions as I now get per week. So it's uh, not that there aren't a lot of issues, it's that people don't always know, uh, as Roshiva said, who to turn to, who the right person is, um, how to get the answers that they need. Sometimes I think there are no answers, uh, and there are very, very unusual questions in the field of mental health. Uh, I was contacted right before Pesach with someone who suffers from uh, dissociation, uh, or what colloquially is known as uh, multiple personalities, and uh, the person basically told me, uh, perhaps the Roshiva would have an answer to this, that one of their personalities uh, doesn't identify as Jewish. They wanted to know if they could eat chametz on Pesach. So uh, these, are, these are unusual questions that you get... Uh, in an unusual field, um, and they're not always uh, simple to answer. They demand not only a halachic sensitivity, but as the people said here also, cultural sensitivity, and also spiritual sensitiv sensitivity. And it's, it's the spiritual sensitivity that I would like to devote uh, the next two minutes to. Because sometimes when I talk about halacha and mental health, people think that I'm talking about leniencies in halacha for the purpose of mental health. And sometimes, those things can also take the form of leniencies. There's no doubt that that's true. But uh, it's not about a heter or an iser. What it really is is about caring for the spiritual needs of the person who's coming to you. And I always say that a, a heter, any heter, but for sure in mental health, is a double-edged sword because any heter that you give can serve to destabilize the person's uh, spiritual standing and help to actually stigmatize the individual. We always talk about stigma. So let's think about it for a second. If I, if I tell a person, right, that they don't need to fast on Yom Kippur, that they don't need to come to the long davening on Rosh Hashanah, so they're at home now, and they're, they're, they don't have to come to the uh, the Rav said I don't have to come to the davening because I'm suffering from depression or whatever. Everybody's in davening. They're doing their thing. I'm at home. And how do I feel? Do I feel part of the community? Do I feel accepted? Do I feel like I've been, like I've been uh, you know, seen? And, or do I feel like I'm being pushed out? Do I feel like... I'm not actually part of the tzibur anymore, not part of the kahal, right? So it's not as simple as just saying yes or no to a shayla. We have to really think carefully when we paskin what we're doing with the psak. The psak can serve to stigmatize as much as not giving up psak can serve to stigmatize sometimes a person. You know, so we need to think about, about a holistic approach really to, to halacha with regards to mental health, which is why I personally think that, uh, you know, and I... I did uh, smicha and, you know, like many other Rabbanim, I don't think that the classic smicha that we go through is enough for us to answer questions about mental health. I think it's a, it's a field in and of itself because it demands a really pinpoint and accurate answer because the wrong answer, once again, whether lenient or straight, it doesn't matter. The wrong answer can set a person on a path to a, a greater deterioration, also from a spiritual and halachic perspective, but also from a mental health perspective, um, if given in the wrong way or at the wrong time. And, and the flip side of that, of course, we do need to respond. We do need to give those answers. And I'll end with one more story, which I often tell, uh, which is that there was a woman who contacted me and asked me what she can do on Shabbos to deal with her anxiety and her depression. I said, what do you do during the week? And she said that she listens to music or she takes a hot shower. So, I, so she said, but I can't do that on Shabbat. I said, okay, before I give you my answer, I said to her, what do you do now in order to cope with those things? So she said, right now, she either induces vomiting or she cuts herself in a non-suicidal fashion. So what I'm trying to say by that story is there is no vacuum, meaning Rabbanim do need to know how to pass in on these things. It's not that people are waiting until we get the right answers and then they're not cope until then they're coping just fine and there's no problem. There are problems and we do need to cope with people. We do need to help them cope in a way that is 
halachically viable, halachically correct, spiritually enriching, and from a mental health perspective, it's really helping them to get over what they're doing and not coping in a very, very bad, negative way. That's a, that's a big malacha that we have to do, and Dr. Harris and I have been working on that you know, for years, but uh, I just wanted to explain that it's not just about pasketing a shayla. Pasketing the shayla, and maybe is the easiest part, but making sure that pasketing the shayla is in concurrence with the spiritual standing of the person and their mental health status, that's the real challenge. Um, one of the dreams I had, together with my late brother Mordechai Fachler, Rabbi Mordechai Fachler, was to have all Rabbonim trained in mental health issues. My brother was a, a, a therapist, he got a doctorate in psychology as well, and he, had, he was receiving patients both as a Rav and as a therapist. And our dream, 25 years ago, when he finished learning in the Meyeshiva and the Rabchaim, and he was in South Africa and he came to London, was to create this cadre of Rabbonim that were educated in mental health as well. Unfortunately, he became sick and was nifted at a very young age. Um, today, I am standing almost to continue his dream. Our sister is here from London. Our cousins are here also. My son is here today. So I think we are getting a lot of nachas from what he had started and others, Bo Hashem, have stepped up and are continuing. And in that vein, I'd like to call on Rabbi Dr. Yaakov Friedman to uh, deny that he's a rabbi. <laughs> That ain't too hard. Um, you know, I would say, hands down, I'm the biggest Amaretz standing up here. I'm not even the best psychiatrist standing up here. I'm definitely not the best dressed psychiatrist standing up here. Uh, that goes without saying. I think what I'm most happy about being in this room, surrounded by colleagues, uh, Rabunam and fantastic individuals in the community is to see that there is a solution on the way to the challenges that mental health poses to our community. One of the things that I frequently say to people is that we cannot have a solution unless we have a problem, and we cannot have a problem unless we talk about it. And when I see so many brilliant people in this room, I know that we have identified a problem and that we are working together collectively towards a solution. And this is something that started a very long time ago. Uh, right now in the audience, we have uh, Rebetz and Tversky. And I remember speaking with the Rav Zetzal about his experience addressing domestic violence in our community. And when I spoke with the Rav about this, he told me that when he was first talking about domestic violence in our community, that the FBI came and assigned him bodyguards because there were death threats against the Rav for standing up and giving a voice to the women who were being abused in our community. Death threats to the point where it was deemed credible threat to the Rav's life, and he needed bodyguards. And now I look in the audience and I see our current Gadol in this field, who's running Wurzweiler, training not just students in America, but also students here in this country from social workers who were trained to address the culturally sensitive need in our community. Hundreds of people are trained every single year to address these challenges, and I am tremendously blessed to be a part of this effort. There is at least one person in this room that I owe an apology to, and if you are that person, please feel free to find me afterwards. End of discussion. Okay, um, we have another 13 minutes to address some of the questions. We received online in advance of this amazing expo 
something in the region of 40 to 50 questions, which we have not the time to address. I'm going to address a couple that did come from numerous people, and hopefully our esteemed panel will be able to address them briefly. Um, and if there's time, we will open up to questions from the audience, but it could be that the questions that we already received uh, will be covered. One of the questions we got from many, many people, and I'll read it out to you, it's called cultural com com competency, thank you, cultural competency. And this is twofold, sending a child for mental health treatment at a non-religious clinic or institution with other non-religious children, and the other is choosing a highly recommended but non-orthodox mental health professional. How would the panel deal with that specific issue? Oshashiva. Yes, sure. There's no generic answer to this. There's absolutely no generic answer to this. Um, we don't automatically, we don't automatically disqualify someone who's not from. You have to know exactly what the issues are. Of course, with the, with the question itself can be cult culturally sensitive. Um, you'd have to have someone that understands. But otherwise, you look for the best treatment. You do that physically, too. And of course, when you're dealing with uh, you know, mental health, there are other issues and people are afraid of uh, uh, hypnosis and brainwashing and you know, all sorts of myths going around. Yes, there could be some attitudes that are, that are transmitted that are not right. The first thing you've got to know is, is this person competent? Is this person the best person to treat the patient? You know, that, that definitely comes first. And then you have to know if there are any other complications there. So my answer, in short, is that there's no generic answer to this. And whom you choose does not necessarily depend on where they're standing religiously or whether or not they're Jewish. Yes, sure, Koch Rav. I, I would like to say that Baruch Hashem, to follow up on what I had said previously, we're in a tremendous place right now where actually some of the most fantastic and gifted clinicians are people within our community. Uh, we are right now sitting next to my dear colleague, who I will embarrass yet again, uh, who is the world's expert in borderline personality disorder and complex trauma, and is also a learned Tamid Hacham. Uh, we, my former neighbor in Boston is one of the world's experts in OCD and the treatment of anxiety disorders. So there are fantastic people in our community who are well versed in providing high quality evidence based treatments. I am the world's expert in putting my foot in my mouth, so I will now return the microphone to Rafaim. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dr. Friedman, again for that bracha of Tov Shabaroifim. I appreciate it. Um, I think I'll just add, um, I wholeheartedly agree with what both Roshi Ship and Dr. Friedman mentioned. Uh, we have numerous organizations now. It's, it's a little bit less relevant in Israel, even though even in Israel as well, we have clinicians who are not from and really are the top of their field, and we would definitely refer to them. Um, but the from community is already at a stage of both um, maturity in terms of understanding these issues and being able to demand certain things and to be in touch with clinicians for them to be culturally sensitive to certain needs. And we see this a lot with, for instance, the work that Amudim does, the relief does, um, real sensitivity in terms of following up there, in terms of a shantran service between mental health clinicians and the from community, making sure that if people are being referred out to, um, to clinicians that aren't from or aren't even Jewish, that they have that understanding. And again, just to repeat what I've mentioned uh, in my introductory <coughs> remarks, that it's almost impossible to properly understand and diagnose and to treat without understanding the cultural background of someone. So we're really already at a stage, Baruch Hashem, I think it's, it's much better than where it's been in the past. And that's really a credit I think to the from community itself that is taking this very seriously and forming connections with clinicians, even those who aren't from and those who aren't religious and who aren't uh, Jewish in terms of the, the importance of cultural sensitivity. I don't have much to, to add. People have said uh, very good things. Um, I'll just mention one uh, thing that I heard from uh, Reversal Schachter and Mordechai Willig uh, from uh, YU when I was uh, asking them shilas for the book. So I asked them about a um, situation where a person wants to send a child to um, a special needs school 
um, he had a choice between sending to a, like a place where they could really help with his mental health challenges, assuming that they were significant, um, and between sending to a more religious place. And what Rav Herschel Schechter specifically said really echoed the same idea, but the way that Rav Schechter said it was, he said, a person needs to be a mensch before he could be a, a Jew. In other words, a person sometimes needs to learn to be, uh, first of all, to be able to do the basic things, the basic routine things uh, that uh, everybody does, to be able to uh, be part of society, to be able to uh, uh, behave, basically, uh, in, a, in a normal fashion before he can learn to do mitzvahs and to say kriyachma, etc., etc., etc. So, um, you know, it really, really depends, of course, on the child, and I agree, and, and that's just what Rav Shiva said, that there's no generic answer. It's not always like that. Depends, of course, on the case and the person, but uh, certainly sometimes um, there is a need also to send to um, uh, frameworks which are outside uh, the religious community. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, the first part of the question I don't think we were able with the time to properly address, and that was sending a child for mental health treatment at a non-religious clinic institution with other non-religious children. So all I can add to this is from my experience in my name, Yeshua, almost every single girl in the eating disorders unit at my name, Yeshua has categorically stated either they, either she or the parents, they would not have sent to anywhere else, even though the mortality rate of eating disorders is over 20%. In other words, they were not sending to places where they didn't feel there was the cultural sensitivity because they didn't want the child to leave the religion, they would rather have them face the, the consequences. The, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a severe thing to say, but I'm just talking from experience. Okay, the next question is also multifaceted, and it's a, it's a difficult one. I think it's, an, um, it's a challenging one. We know the pasuk of Loi Telech Wachil Alamecho, which is the basis for not giving Loshon Hora, not saying, not telling tales on Loshon Hora. The same pasuk finishes off with, well, it continues, Lotamod Adam Reocho. You're not allowed to stand aside knowing that somebody is in danger. So there were four questions sent with this heading. First of all, knowing that a so called mental health professional is not really qualified. A patient through therapy admits to being a victim of domestic abuse. How do we handle that? What medical condition information is allowed or must be shared during Shiduchim? And does a patient sharing information with a mental health professional about other family members ever constitute Lashon Hora? So any of those issues, or Shashiva, would be, we'd be honored for some guidance. First, in terms of the, the, the basic framework, is basically avoiding something, I guess, under the vague category we, we call gossip. Evil speech is speech that is either degrading or harmful. It's evil. Helping somebody is not evil. The Sefer Achinuch, in defining the Yisrael Selech Rachel already throws in a condition, unless it's the quiet Eimach Lokis. You're, allowed, you're not to say anything degrading about another, about another Jew, but if it's for the sake of, de, of quieting my focus, it's permissible. Now, he doesn't generally throw rules into definitions. What he's trying to do is establish the definition of Lashon Hara is evil speech. When you're dealing with trying to help somebody that's an evil speech, of course there are conditions. If you can avoid it, make sure you're not causing any undue harm. There, there are lots of conditions. But the general framework where you're doing something constructive is not Lashon Hara, but there's some kind of hitter. That, that's not Lashon Hara. That's not evil speech to begin with. Now, the question, uh, of course, becomes, is it something of a free-for-all? If you're sitting in a therapist's office, just do whatever you want. It depends. You know, there are some who need that freedom to release a lot of what, what they've experienced. Um, and, and therefore, that, that in itself is, uh, is therapeutic. Um, you know, no, no question about that. In many situations, that's not what you're dealing with. What you're dealing with is something very, very specific. And the question is, does everything have to be told? Can you speak about, for example, a family member, a parent, with respect, despite the fact that you're, you're trying to express something? 
that's complex. And again, if there were no generic a a answers before, so much more here. You know, sometimes telling someone that you've got to you've got to speak with respect will not at all help them with their therapy. You kind of know who you're dealing with and what the situation is. If it's called for, fine. If you see a patient just sitting there and ranting, you got to stop them. That's not the way to live. If you see that they're not doing, they're not letting off whatever it is, their anger, their frustration, their resentment. But they're taking advantage of the situation. Here they're paying for someone to listen to them rant. So of course you got to stop them. I wonder if you had such experiences. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, in terms of the Lashon Hara that you, as a, a clinician here, so as a general rule, it's so basic, and the truth of the matter is that this is, this is one of the, the, one of the, 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 the Torah's, uh, I guess, basic principles that, that are, there is the foundation for all psychological treatment, and that is, the Torah holds us responsible for emotion. They say the Rama master Kasha, how is that possible? The Torah tells us to whom to love. You have to love Hashem. You have to love your fellow Jew. The Torah tells us when to be happy. How can the Torah require us to feel? You know, feeling is spontaneous. How can the Torah tell us how to feel? The basic idea there is we must know. Situations are heaven sent. How you experience those situations is dependent on you. It's your mindset. So much of therapy is to teach people how to experience things differently, whether in, in the present or even in the past. It's teaching people, it's rewiring them in how to experience things. Someone is sitting here, sitting there and telling you about someone you know. Whether it's advisable or not, good question. The patient sitting in front of you is someone you know, and when he's talking about his father, you know who that is. And he's saying all of these nasty things about him. Now, there's an issue of Kabbalah, there's an issue of Shmiya Slashnar, of Kabbalah Slashnar. Shmiya Slashnar, just to hear it, of course, here it's for constructive purpose. But Kabbalah Slashnar, you never to believe it. So what am I supposed to say? I'm going to treat you, but I don't, I don't believe a word you're saying. What kind of treatment is that going to be? You've got to believe that this patient is not lying to you. They are describing what they experienced. Could they have experienced it otherwise? Did it happen in the way they experienced it? Who knows? I wasn't there. That's very, very important. Every clinician's got to know that. Otherwise, it's Kabbalah, Slosh, Nahara, and, and you know something? If you believe everything your patients tell you, you're, you're not so confident. <laughs> so th that, and this is really, psychology is all, all based on that. The fact that the human being is really has the power to, to teach himself how to experience life. You don't have to change your circumstances. You can learn to be happy with existing circumstances. You know, if, if you can change the circumstances, why not? But there are times that that's, in, that's just not doable. You have to learn to experience things differently. So in terms of believing, of course you don't believe, but you do believe. You believe that the patient is giving you an accurate description of what they experienced. Is that, is that what happened? Who knows? Who knows? When they do report something, uh, you know, they do report uh, abuse, domestic abuse, certainly. So legally, you're already bound, you've got to report. In halacha, there's always a question. If they know that you're going to report, are people going to go to therapists? Will people who need help go to therapists if you know that you're going to, they know that you're going to report? You know, there are so many. Uh, they suffer, but they don't want anyone to lock their parent up. Well, um, it's a whole other discussion. For the most part, at this point, a therapist does not have much of a choice. Because legally, if you're dealing with domestic violence, if you're dealing with any kind of a, a, a victim where the perpetrator is somebody who has responsibility over him, you must report. And there's not much to talk about. Um, and you know something? Uh, it's generally the right way to go in the end. In terms of sharing this information with someone else for Shaduchim, for example, no. I mean, you as a, as a, as a clinician, well, then forget it. I mean, you're going to lose your clientele. And, and the issue is not just Parnassa. The issue is, you know, our community is going to lose their professionals. 
people will not have him to turn to. Why should anyone go for help if everyone, and what's with MD? You know, what's with, the, what's with the physician? What's with the physician? If a medical doctor is allowed to disclose, you know, you're having a medical condition, who's gonna go to a doctor? So of course, you know, it, it, all of that, that must be respect, confidentiality must be respected. There's a big difference between reporting and tell what a clinician must do is in a case where halacha says that you've got to tell anything that will jeopardize one, one's ability to be a father, mother, to be a parent, to be a spouse, that has to be told when you're dealing with, with or something that is hereditary, uh, that's going to be passed on, something serious, of course, um, or anything that is just going to make life very, very difficult, or could shorten someone's lifespan drastically, something like that has to be told. The clinician should encourage the patient to tell. They should consult with a rub just when and how to go about it. Time is up. I know you're sorry. This is the first annual Mental Health Expo. The next one will not be a year away, Bizrat Hashem. We'll do it much quicker than that. We hear the issues, and I want to do it for the Hebrew-speaking population as well, and I need volunteers to help me do that. I want to thank the Rosh Hashiva once again for the time. He also has to go to Yeshia now. Thank Rabbi Yaakov Friedman, Shmuel Harris, Amyoni. I'm not going to give the sponsorship speech. That'll be the next time. Thank you all for coming. Could you please allow the Rosh Hashiva to go back to his Yeshiva to give a shir as we go out? Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>